presentation. So, but now we have a few questions for you. Um, first, we have a um, few questions for uh, for you guys and uh, to put some context about your presentation. Uh, then Elizabeth uh, will talk about um, uh, the method in your papers and she had questions about uh, the variables. Then uh, I will talk about other papers and their conclusions and uh, um, and I have a question about this too. And uh, then uh, Juan Jose will talk about uh, an, um, a, li a link with austerity and and your and the political economy perspective. Okay, uh, hey guys, how are you? So for you to wake up a little bit, uh, we have a couple of questions in which we would like you to participate. So first, we would like to know uh, if you know if in the last 15 years, especially after the great financial crisis, there has been any episode of fiscal consolidation in your country. This means a change in taxes, a change in government expenditure, policies, et cetera, et cetera. And if so, if you can raise your hand, if you know there was this type of policies. Okay, you can see around that most of our countries present in this, and there's a, a reason why this happens, as we saw, these were imposed by these austerity policies or this austerity spirit, especially of the financial crisis. So briefly, uh, we would like to know if some of you would like to share if you know about any interesting experience in your country of these fiscal consolidations that you would like to bring into our discussions. Volunteers, yeah. Uh, well, hi, I am from Uruguay, uh, South America. And um, actually what happened was right before the financial crisis, there was a major tax reform. Um, income tax became progressive, um, a big de-dollarization of the economy, uh, like uh, the debt was mainly shifted to pesos and changed the, the times and the, the, the rates. And, um, and those things, actually when the crisis happened, kind of prevented it from hitting hard the country. So it was one year before, like 2007 was the big tax reform that made taxes progressive and uh, more egalitarian in a way. Thank you, Joaquí. So it will be like an expansionary uh, experience. Anybody else wants to share some experience? Oh yeah, and if you participate, you have a price, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Mathieu from France, and we have this policy called the CICE, uh, where basically there was a cut in taxes uh, to boost the innovation for the great, uh, the, the major companies, multinational companies of France, and the main result was nothing. So the, the increase in employment was null. Uh, the the only thing it was like more more dividend for shareholders. So this this has an, or, um, neither effect on employment or like the country of uh, public expenditure, it was a gift for the richest company, basically. Yeah, in the Czech Republic, just during COVID, where the budgets were kind of the uh, most burdened by all the like support policies, the right wing gov government decided to uh, change the taxation of wages, uh, which benefited mostly the high income classes. Um, but it was it was kind of this uh, policy that was supposed to support everyone and lower the taxes for everyone. But in reality, it helps uh, the uh, high high income class much more. And um, yeah, it was crazy how the debate was like the narrative around was formed, and uh, uh, no one actually raised any concerns about it, or very very little. Thank you. So we can see. Uh, th there's other participation, don't worry. So you can see that uh, this type of policies and this spirit is not something strange for our countries. Uh, so now we will 
Okay, um, we promised 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the summary paper. So we have sheets of paper with us, I believe. And it's just a little game. We just, I know Ipog wants to raise uh, economists who are up to date with the world economy. And so I have two questions for everybody. The first is which OECD country features in the paper that featured in the paper has the highest public debt to GDP ratio? You have two minutes to raise uh, your answer. Oh, no, 30 seconds. <laughs> No, no, just raise, just raise your answer. And I'll let you know if you're right. No, 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 no Googling, no phones. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer the first five people. Joel, what was your response? C, who else? How many people chose C? If it's not C, okay. Great. <laughs> no, share the sweets, I guess. Okay, so no, the answer is definitely C. And I'm going to show a graph for that. And then the final, um, no, 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 that, no, not yet. Okay, you could. So yeah, Japan, Japan actually has the highest. And if you chose Greece, or if you were thinking Greece, Greece is not in the paper. <laughs> so <laughs> it was just, yeah, so um, Japan has the highest public debt to GDP ratio to 262.5 percent and that's pretty high and then the second question very quickly is which among the following countries do you think has the highest debt to gdp ratio so this question was inspired by the fact that oecd countries were featured in the paper but we also wanted to capture many more of us like from here this is a very universal class so uh which among the following i know this is harder so i think you deserve like more chocolate <laughs> cakes uh okay nada okay one Two. Anybody has a, a contrary opinion? Russia. He got it. It's Egypt. <laughs> so, yeah. So Argentina is pretty close, but Egypt still had the highest 89.2%, uh, essentially. So, uh, I hope you've learned more about our countries. I, I once thought that Nigeria was going to be like 100%, <laughs> but I'm just kidding. Okay, so um, I'll just give the summary of the paper right about now. Um, the, the background just talks about, I think the paper deals with a post from the, the financial crisis time, like right after that. And then it went on to talk about fin finan and fiscal consolidation. And that's basically, we know it more as austerity policies. So just take that as, you know, a synonym. And so from there, it's asking, the contribution of this paper is literally asking, okay, what everybody's talking about when, when there's an increase in expenditure, government expenditure or investment, what happens to GDP, what happens to GDP ratio? And then this paper said, okay, we want to come to give like, we want to quantify, we want to make some um, quanti con quantifiable contributions to this argument in the literature. And then we saw that. So basically I just put this because to create kind of like a drawing in our heads about what really happened when there was a reduction in either government expenditure or government investment. And that's exactly why we threw out the question, like almost every of our countries has gone through this. And what we saw was much more of increasing debt to GDP ratio. We saw a declining growth rate, we saw unemployment and blah, blah, blah. And so experientially, even though we had not carried out any, um, any experiments, we could literally interact with that or identify with that. And then the methodology, it's, I mean, I don't know what I want to say here because everything has been presented, but basically talks about the variable of interest in the paper. We're interested in output GDP as well as the debt to GDP ratio are all listed out. This is the um, pro projections, look how projections approach, talks about the country and time effects, the identified shock. So I basically did all of this planning to present, but because of time, I will just keep skipping. And then this talks about just the, outline of the methodology. So maybe you want to write your master's program using the <laughs> approach. We will share our slides with you. You feel free to talk about. So I am um, shocked we identified. And in the paper, two approaches were used, Blanchard and Parity 2002, and the nar narrative approach. I think basically the Blanchard and Parity brings in like lagged effect. All these were really, really dealt with in the paper. So I would not be repeating that. And then you move on to the impulse response functions, where there were two different methods used by previous authors that were um, previous authors in the literature. These are the steps, scale shocks as a percentage of GDP. One talks up, one uses the mean GDP to 
one uses the mean GDP over the whole sample period, but the other one just does it per period. So each time there's a use of GDP over over output, um, output over debt over output. Sorry. Um, then the second method, the same, very similar. We scale the fiscal variable shock instead by using this. So this is one I talked about, but that's the basic difference between the two. So one does a G over Y for the entire sample period, like a mean, like an average, but this deals with G over Y for each point in time, government um, to output, government expenditure to output ratio. And then you estimate the cumulative effects. Look, at this, these are like three steps you have to take under the Ramsey and Zubairi 2018 method. So what are the findings, policy implications? I basically just went directly to this because I think we're all interested in understanding how our countries can benefit from this study. Um, we're not all very quantitative. I'm actually not very quantitative. I decided to pretend that I know everything <laughs> that I heard on the slides, but I mean, the presentation was a bit, was way clearer than when I read the paper. So um, use, using both uh, methods of identification in that methodology, um, methodology process, there's the impulse response functions. They show a degree of persistence. And, you know, Professor already explained that, that that implies that when when our countries decide or when our governments decide to increase expenditure or investment, it even goes beyond the five year span that was discussed in the paper. So there are longer term effects or um, even more benefits than envisaged right from the very beginning. Then the second point is that government spending multipliers were above unit, regardless of the identification method used. And, you know, one of the major strengths I like one of the major strengths of this paper is how it combines different methods and different models. And all these methods and models reinforce the fact that increasing government spending or increasing government investment still leads to you know, higher GDP and lower debt to GDP ratios. So um, that was very, that was something different because some papers just use like the structural vector to regression models and those, those came with their limitations, but this you know, went further to the um, local projections approach and then those limitations were removed. And so it, it just you know, brings in all of these things and they complement each other and still reinforces the post-Kenshan, the Kenshan, idea that definitely when we increase government expenditure or government investment, we see um, better output and we see lower debt to GDP ratio. So here, this is just like fiscal composition wise. It's also important to know that if, we, if, we, if you are in a policy space, well, which of them would you increase? Government expenditure on an investment in, from paper shows that there's a high, there are higher positive multiplier estimates than um, when you increase government consumption. So that means we, you would rather prefer to increase government investment than consumption, especially with respect to the OECD countries. I'm not sure if this applies to the developing countries, but probably we'll come back to that. So though government consumption um, multipliers exhibit values above units. So before this time, I mean, much of literature talks um, speaks on government consumption multipliers being if, even negative or zero. So they feel that, oh, no, no, no. If you increase government consumption, there's no way there's going to be an increase in output or a reduction in debt to GDP ratio. But this paper contributed to the fact that even if you increase government consumption, there's still something positive there. And then finally, expansionary fiscal policies yield lower debt to GDP. So basically saying the same thing, but you know, seeing it from different angles. So I think I would. So my question is, um, yeah, I think I could find maybe in the model where to put this, like the control variables where you had pl planted the interest rates. I was really curious to know if trade openness fa was factored into the estimation of these multipliers. And if not, how do you think it would affect the size of the estimated fiscal multipliers? Um, so, um, so we have read uh, some papers uh, in the same uh, subjects. But you have done uh, a lot about uh, different methodology uh, in your presentation, so uh, I will be quick. Uh, so um, those as uh, a few other papers that come to the same uh, conclusions, and for for example, the first one by uh, Olivier Blanchard and Daniel Late. It's not a 2002 uh, paper, but uh, it is after the 2008 crisis. And it, uh, it arrived to the conclusion that uh, the fiscal multiplier were higher than uh, assumed by the forecaster. Uh, it's, its conclusion was the same uh, in uh, 2020 uh, in this paper by uh, uh, in the Oxford Bulletin of Economics and Statistics. 
and uh, so second one and uh, even with this uh, new data and uh, and uh, and uh, 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 more complex methods maybe uh, it's it's arrived to the same conclusion than the first one and the third one is quite interesting because it is a meta regression analysis on uh, more than 100 pap uh, 100 papers uh, about uh, fiscal policy subjects and uh, this arrives to to the same uh, to the same uh, 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 conclusions but uh, we had uh, an, an, a question about this so there is uh, a lot of papers uh, talking about fiscal fiscal policies in uh, OECD countries for example there is uh, in your paper I think it's 14 OECD countries analysis but uh, there uh, we would like to know uh, your if you have uh, any uh, ideas about uh, the same type of fiscal policies uh, in developing countries, for example, or lower fiscal countries with less monetary sovereignty uh, uh, countries, and uh, if you, because we didn't find a uh, lot of papers talking about this. So, uh, our part four, we would like to introduce a political economy perspective, and we will link this with austerity that has already been done in the presentation by, by Professor. Uh, because as we were, as we can see in the in the in the exercise, these fiscal consolidation episodes are not something only for OACD countries or only for Europe, but it has been implemented in many countries, especially in the recent years, and. This is in a context of politics or policies as budget uh, cuts, especially in welfare expenditures, public education, healthcare, housing, unemployment benefits. Also episodes of regress regressive taxation, deflation, privatization, wage repressions, and employment deregulation. Right? So uh, in this context, we uh, refer to a recent uh, work uh, done by Clara Matei in her new book, The Capital Order, where she presents a historical analysis and she focuses on the role of what she calls the austerity regime, right? All these policies, this mix of policies done in, in the recent years, she starts with that, but as we will see, this is not something new, right? It's not something that appears after the fiscal, uh, the great financial crisis, it's not something that appears even in neoliberalism. Right? It, this is a core uh, aspect of capitalism itself. Uh, and that's why she uh, tried to identify what is the role of this of austerity in capitalism in general and its different expressions through time, even in fascism during the golden era, in neoliberalism, et cetera, et cetera. So a couple of important ideas that we take from her work is that first, under this regime, austerity policies had been used to reestablish what she calls the capital order, right? This means to reestablish the, the correct function of capitalism to benefit capital, right? To benefit uh, this capital order. And this is expressed in the correct function within labor, between firms, between capital, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But she identifies that these policies are applied to reestablish this order, especially during and after crisis, right? But this is that does not mean that it's only being applied during a crisis, right? But it's especially used by politicians uh, in these episodes, right? Uh, the second idea that we would like to bring today is that austerity uh, could and should be understood in three dimensions. And this is what Matei calls the austerity trinity, right? Fiscal austerity, that is what we are talking today in the presentation, but also monetary austerity and industrial austerity. And in this sense, as we have seen, like fiscal austerity is uh, related to regressive taxation, is regretted to cut in, ex in public expenditure, is uh, such as health, uh, education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in this sense, monetary austerity is related to revaluation policies, for example, or increases in interest rates and reductions in money supply, uh, protecting creditors 
and increasing the value of their savings, of creditor savings, among other policies. But also important is industrial austerity. And this is related to auditorium industrial policies like layoff of public employers, uh, wage reductions, union and strike busting, et cetera, et cetera. So for her, this austerity trinity requires all of these three austerities to help each other to reestablish this capital order, right? And the third important idea here is that the main core or the main goal of this has to be seen through the lenses of class com conflict, right? It's a matter of class austerity, in which sense, who is being benefited by these policies, but more importantly, who is losing as a consequences of these fiscal consolidations and this fiscal and of course, monetary and industrial austerity in the short and also in the long run, right? So uh, re regarding this, we would like to also ask that beyond the quantitative measurement of fiscal uh, multipliers, how do we go about the implementation of fiscal expansions? Because we can agree for the presentation and from other papers that fiscal expansion is good for the economy, right? But beyond the quantitative me measurement of this, how we go, to not only archive debt, debt sustainability, but also improve quality of life uh, through this policy implementation. So to measure these will be our three questions for you, Professor, in the, in, in the presentation of your paper. Ah, yeah. And also this last question is related because you, you didn't touch it that much, but another debate here is that military expenditure is also good for the economy. But we were wondering, okay, maybe macroeconomically and to increase GDP and to reduce uh, debt to GDP ratio. But at the end of the day, what's the impact, the direct impact into quality of life of increasing military policies? Because Matei, for example, points out that, okay, austerity, should not be just about okay how much we are reducing the the public expenditure or how much we are reducing the public investment but especially where we are reducing it we especially we're not reducing it in in, in, in military expenditure but we are reducing it in in welfare benefits we're reducing it in housing we're reducing it in wage public wages etc cetera, etc cetera. so at the end of the day this this political economy perspective also lead us to ask ourselves how we can go beyond just measuring this and uh, taking into account how we reduce public expend uh, public debt to, to ratio to GDP, but how to improve life. Um, yeah, that will be it. Thank you. You wanna sit there to answer? <laughs> so we can answer all these three, and then after we. Um... So let me pass down to the discussion. Then we give more the time. And uh, I discuss with uh, some some points that I was thinking about in the discussion. Of course, I'm including that figure in the record. From richer to poorer, the fiscal multiplier would increase because the propensity to consume, the average propensity to consume, um, will will increase. And this, of course, this uh, through the accelerator effect has also impact on the level of uh, private investment. Uh, cut in taxes, uh, boost innovation. This is a real, the really old, funny stories. Uh, yes, I work on that when when I we work at UCL. Uh, we work on uh, assessing with Professor Mazzucato and other uh, authors. We we work to assess the impact of several fiscal measures on uh, uh, on GDP and private R and D investment, and we compare the government investment in research and development through 
tax rate and we saw that tax rate does not produce any effect on private investment in research and development and then in innovation while the real engine for stimulated private R&D investment is the public investment in, uh, in R&D. So let's move to question, very hard question. So uh, I suspect that I'm not an expert, an expert on, on developing, developing countries, but I suspect the multipliers will be lower uh, because they should import a lot of... Uh, and I give you this example. I, 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 I have written with other colleagues, with Professor Tosi and Professor Romaniello, uh, a paper uh, in Italy comparing the fiscal multiplier in the north and in the south of Italy. Uh, I don't know if, if there is some Italians or if there is uh, some who knows the history of, uh, of Italy, but there is the richer north and the poor south in Italy. And we estimate fiscal multiplier by dividing this sample in two blocks, the north, the center north and the south. What we found, we found that fiscal multipliers is positive and greater, but the multipliers is greater in the north rather than in the south. Why this occur? Because the south import from abroad, namely from the north in this case, a lot of goods. So the demand of the south stimulate the production of the, more, the north. I suspect that the same reasoning can be applied to uh, to developing countries, but I think that there is a plan in developing countries based on investment to stimulate uh, uh, industrial policy. And then I arrived also on the, the points of uh, fiscal monetary industrial policy. Um, this uh, could create uh, capacity in, uh, in developed region. Here I suggest a famous paper by Garegnani of the 90s, in the 90s, where he argues that uh, uh, Italian government uh, should have should uh, increase uh, more money in the south of Italy to develop uh, industrial, uh, industrial sector. Then, uh, um, yes, of course, uh, monetary sovereignty, uh, you are right, but I, I don't know how to answer. In this case, if, uh, if uh, central bank is not uh, related to the governments, the increase in government expenditure could be crowded out by external market or external policy, yes this probably could occur. And uh, of course, uh, we need to, we don't need to spend more money. So when, in my opinion, uh, you have to study the multiplier of uh, military spending because you have to understand if military spending is uh, um, produce positive or negative effect of growth. Then you have to move on what society you want. I don't want a society and going uh, around with arms, of course. And uh, of course, uh, in Italy, for instance, uh, the last uh, 10 years, we cut a lot uh, welfare spending in school, uh, in education, in university, in uh, wealth, in hospital, but we do not cut uh, government uh, expenditure in the military sector. Indeed, in the last, uh, in the last day, they vote, for instance, another uh, package to send army, uh, for instance, to, to Ukraine. And, um, and concerning uh, the austerity trinity, is a good, uh, it seemed to me a good definition. And uh, I would say that, of course, we have, uh, um, we have uh, we, in European countries a lot of austerity on the spending side, on the fiscal side. We do not have austerity on the monetary side because you know that there was the quantitative easing and the interest rate were, was uh, uh, really low. And uh, Industrial austerity, I would say that is part of the fiscal austerity. 
because uh, I don't think that uh, industrial policy can be done uh, with flowers, meaning that uh, in order uh, to make an industrial policy, government should invest and increase public expenditure in, in mission, uh, alla mazzucato, or in specific sector to develop a uh, uh, specific sector of the economy. And uh, monetary policy, another uh, issue related uh, to study that I have done uh, uh, a few years ago. Yes, monetary policy, when there is increase in interest rate, uh, this could uh, lead to negative consequences on uh, real wages because uh, uh, price tend to increase rather than decrease after a monetary policy tightening. And this can be see another harm for capitalists to lower uh, real wages. So I stop here. And uh, if you want to question okay. curiosity, I want to ask you to um, say your name before the question. Hi, Matteo. Uh, João from Brazil. Thank you a lot for. So from the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, <laughs> later today. It's like importantly um no thank you a lot for the presentation i think it's a very interesting topic i have two questions one i think uh, a bit more clarification but i think also curiosity uh the the multipliers you showed uh at, at least for the job to the debt to gdp seem to change a lot between the two methodologies uh so which characteristic of the methodology you think makes most difference and which one you think explain or show better what is the reality of these countries um so that's the first question and the second question is related to the trade openness how do you think um so fiscal expenditure also relates to capital flows and capital controls because i in brazil at least i think in most developing countries like the orthodoxy always comes with this narrative of fiscal dominance that if there is too much uh, fiscal expenditure, you would lo lose control of monetary policy, and then you would have outflows of capitals, uh, maybe mostly from speculation, but I think also like FDIs and so on. So uh, if you if you have any opinion on that, and and how do you think those things relate? Um, thank you, Professor Mateo. Um, also, thank you, my friends, for the presentation. Um, so uh, it's kind of two questions in one. Um, I was thinking in terms of implications for policy of your presentation, and I was thinking, yeah, most of the time in super multiplier, we we talk about government expenditures as in general, yes, and it was great that you made the differentiation consumption investment. But I was thinking more also like if you could look at sectors of the economy, because um, I was thinking, okay, maybe we can, government can invest more in a sector that employ more, uh, and then you have impacts more on wages, or you can invest more in a sector that is more techno tech has more technology and more value added. And I was thinking like, if there is, what would be the impacts of these in terms of the multiplier and in terms of in the debt to, uh, ratio if you if you have this sectorial view which sector probably would go for and then um a, co a continuation for this for example in developing countries i think we have a lot of informality so i, I think the thing of uh, um imports in in the italian study and i'd like to know if you think informality also is something that can be a barrier for this multiplier effects and um Yes, if at the end, okay, probably you think they are l lower these values for developing countries, and if you think this is this has to do, thank you. Hello. Uh, I am Mohamed, and do you understand? You, you hear me? No. Okay, so I am Mohamed, and I just want to profess that I agree with the premises when it comes to 
to developed countries or rich countries whose deficit don't matter so they can engage in in a fiscal expansion to a certain extent but i just want to ask you about the inherent uncertainty of public expenditure when it comes to developing countries who who has to care about the their public budget their debt uh, specifically when the debt is denominated in foreign currency. So even if we assume that there will be a positive impact of a fiscal expansion, we cannot be certain about this. So there is an inherent risk out there uh, of the country finding itself with a large public deficit in the future that will then uh, force it to basically cut spending and perhaps basically nullify the positive effect of the fiscal expansion. So could you please speak a little bit about that? Thank you. So a lot of question on uh, developing countries that are not an expert on, but I try to, to, to say something. Uh, Blanchard de Perotti versus narrative approach. I would prefer for sure uh, the uh, Blanchard de Perotti strategy. And uh, because the Blanchard de Perotti strategy is compute structural shock, while the narrative approach is based on the qualitative assessment, meaning that uh, there is the Korea War. Here I set a dummy, and it's based on a qualitative assessment of, uh, of uh, fiscal shock. And in my opinion, uh, findings with the Blanchard de Perotti is more reliable than the one on the narrative approach. Concerning the, your question and your question with the trade inflow, so if, if I do uh, uh, fiscal policy expansion of fiscal policy could run uh, in uh, external uh, increase in external debt and problem to exchange rate. I don't know how to answer to this question. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, <coughs> you should have a, a balance bala balance between fiscal and monetary policy. Fiscal and monetary policy need to be coordinated in order to allow governments to run investment and do industrial policy and use the leverage of, uh, of exchange of interest rate and then exchange rate to vary and to allow to not enter in uh, a trade deficit, for instance. Uh, sector of economy and informality. Informality for sure with lower fiscal multiplier is very easy because in, on, on, uh, on uh, on the spending side, you, you, you can measure uh, the, the correct value of an expenditure. On the private sector, if there is a lot of informality, it means that uh, you underestimate uh, the, the, the level of economic activity of the pri uh, private sector. And concerning uh, um, your, second que your first question uh, related to the sector of the economy, and um, yes, it could be interested. It would be more, in my opinion, more technical difficulties in estimating uh, such uh, such a, such a model empirically. While I know, and if you are interested, I can can give you some references. They are now <coughs> applying stock flow consistent model to input output model. So. This uh, the the merge of this method would allow to compute and assess uh, uh, fiscal multiplier at the sectoral level. And there, if I don't remember wrong, there was also studies in the eighties using input output table and estimating multiplier at sectoral uh, sectoral level. But I don't I do not found too much literature on uh, on that. Hello, thank you, Professor, and thank you also to my colleagues. 
building on Gabrielle's question about informality, I think also in developing, sorry, it's another question about developing hands. <laughs> um, but building on, on the level of informality and low access to credit in developing countries, do you think that maybe the um, fiscal multiplier of uh, public consumption will be higher than the one of public investment, even more given that usually governance of institutions in developing countries tend to be weak and that we have a huge problem when it comes to the selection and implementation of infrastructure projects? Do you think that maybe the fiscal multipliers will be, the public consumption will be higher than the fiscal multiplier of um, investment? Yeah, in the um, I, I wanted to talk about like in the mainstream theory, like the, the main argument against the fiscal policy or extension policy is the fact that there, there is a crowding out uh, effect. And I wanted to know if there is like example where there is really this effect or not, and uh, what could determine um, such an effect. Not you. So government consumption multiplier greater than uh, government investment multiplier. Uh, I don't think so uh, because, uh, for instance, I don't know, also in Italy, we have uh, a lot of informality and in the investment sector when you need to build a, a, a roads, a highway, the train, there is a lot of... Uh, uh, collusion, I don't know in English, collusion, uh, but estimates of the multiplier in Italy suggest you that investment uh, create a greater effect on output uh, than, uh, than, uh, than consumption. I don't know in developing countries and uh, maybe I cannot answer to, to your question. Uh, crowding out and crowding in, Yes, the, ma the, main, uh, the main effect pass through uh, the same, the, the, always the same idea. You have an increase in government expenditure. The increase in government expenditure or increase the demand of money or increase the public debt to GDP ratio and the deficit. This uh, increase the risk in the system. This would increase the interest rate and the increase in interest rate uh, will decrease uh, uh, the volume of private investment and uh, consumption spending. So uh, in, in my studies, uh, first of all, I never estimate a positive response of interest rate. In many times, interest rate decrease or are not affected by uh, fiscal policy because, because interest rate also in a Keynesian perspective are controlled by the central bank, both in the short and the long run. And the reaction of interest rate uh, is dependent on policy decision of the central bank. Uh, concerning the effect of interest rate on, uh, on uh, private expenditure, also here I'm a bit skeptical because uh, we are working now with our colleagues uh, in uh, Roma 3 University on assessing the, because my, in the last year I work uh, on fiscal policy and monetary policy. One, one of the paper that uh, we are doing is uh, assessing the impact of fiscal policy shock or of monetary policy shock on demand and on, author, on components of demand. Uh, in this paper, what, we have shown, we have shown that yes, monetary policy can affect aggregate demand. Monetary policy can affect, for instance, residential investment, so building houses, while the effect on private consumption and the effect on investment in equipment, so the investment that increase the capital stock is, is can't, is absent. So, the idea that uh, government expenditure crowding out uh, private expenditure, in my opinion, is a wrong idea for two reasons. First of all, if there is a greater demand, level of demand, uh, firms will increase the level of investment in order to be able to 
to uh, meet that level of demand. And, uh, and second, uh, the, the effect of interest rate is can't uh, in is absent on uh, on private uh, on private investment mainly and uh, um, we have a large amount of unemployment this is really important because uh, uh, demand full employment policy because uh, what the message that i would like to say is that in order to achieve the full employment we have to do <laughs> five ten percent of deficit spending and don't care about uh, public debt because the public debt with the would decrease uh, we have uh, the opportunity with that kind of spending to arrive to arrive to a full employment and is it, in my opinion this is the only way to achieve a full employment we don't need to work on uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, labor market flexibility or decreased wages. But with Barca was for like flexible uh, labor market. Uh, yes, yes, because they have in mind the classical demand curve of labor. No, if you decrease wages, you increase the volume of uh, of uh, of employed pe uh, people employed in uh, people employed. No? Oh, I, have a, I have a question on developing countries. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Well, if uh, nobody else, yes. Um, I, I just want to comment on your response regarding developing countries because what I do believe in is that in developing countries, there is a need for somehow a fiscal consolidation geared toward industrialization. And what I mean by that is that basically you need some kind of austerity in the sense that you need high taxes, uh, probably on the middle class and on the poor people, basically to increase the level of savings and then to channel those savings into in basically subsidizing industry and then to use the fund from industry to subsidize it further until basically you you reach some kind of status of a rich or at least a middle income country so perhaps austerity is bad for rich countries but some kind of austerity may be beneficial for poor or developing countries this is at least what i have understood from the literature that i research thanks Is a comment. Do you want to? Do you want to? It's, I accept this comment. Do you accept? <laughs> and thank you. Okay, so if uh, nobody else wants to make a question, thank you so much. Thank you so much.